Thanks, thanks. So I think most of us in the room know, most of us in the room, but if there are a few that, that may not be of this place, I am uh, Tim Stenson, I'm the undergrad chair, and it is uh, it's my charge uh, and, and my great pleasure to introduce this evening's uh, lecturer, Brad Lynch. Uh, and I'll try to do that quickly, but sort of elliptically. At, at the beginning of the 20th century, Frank Lloyd Wright, a Wisconsin-born but Chicago-based architect, was projecting, uh, I think it's fair to say, new form. It was, it was low slung, laterally extensive, space embracing, pinwheel organized form, which pretty soon came to be uh, known as a prairie style. He certainly was a restless producer uh, and Wright developed numerous projects, residential projects during this time and in this manner, including his own Wisconsin retreat that he called Taliesin. That was 1911. Uh, just a few years later, uh, I think in the, the mid-teens, uh, Wright hired two Austrian expat friends, uh, first Rudolf Schindler and then Richard Neutra. Uh, and then they, having moved from Vienna or parts of Central Europe to Chicago to work for Wright, then they both in turn moved to the Southwest, uh, specifically to LA where uh, each developed their own substantial and historically significant practices, which is almost unique amongst Wright alum, which is, which is interesting, but not on point. Uh, Neutra's work, which I'm sure many of you know, uh, and all of you should know, uh, included a number of residential commissions that can be seen as a kind of desert modern reincarnation of Wright's uh, northern Midwest uh, prairie homes, but like Taliesin. The most iconic of the Neutra projects, the one that if you know Neutra, you, if you know a little of Neutra, you certainly know this one, was his 1946 uh, Kaufman House. Um, which was commissioned, it's this iconic project, was commissioned, of course, by the same Edgar Kaufman that commissioned 10 years earlier, that commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, who produced for him Falling Water. What, you might now be asking, um, if I were you, I'd be asking, what is it, has any of this to do with, with Brad Lynch? Brad might be saying, what does this have to do with my lecture? Um, you know, did I pick up Jonathan Massey's history uh, survey notes and mistakenly use them for his introduction? Um, but in fact, it's, it's my attempt to both offer an appreciation and to cont contextualize uh, Brad Lynch's work just, just a bit, or at least from a certain perspective. So, if Edgar Kaufman was still living, and if he was, he'd be pushing 130, and he had left Pittsburgh yet again, and as 130-year-olds will do, I suppose, instead of going to the Palm Desert, like he did to commission, where he commissioned uh, Neutra to do his uh, iconic house, instead he moved to the, back to the Northern Plains, or to the Northern Plains, and commissioned another Wisconsin-born, Chicago-based architect to build yet another beautiful house, maybe this time it would be Brad Lynch. For at least, it seems to me, Brennan Stoll Lynch's work especially its residential work, is very much in the, in the tradition of Wright and Neutra. Laterally extended, open space and light filled, uh, beautifully composed residential space set in a sort of extended recumbent embrace with its landscape. Throughout, Brinstool and Lynch's work is directed and informed by, I would say, an unerring eyeball balancing volume, rich surface, exquisite material palette, and assembly, all of those things consistently in a long series of projects of absolutely singular clarity and of the highest quality. 
So regardless of the silly story of Edgar Kaufman is 130 years old and he commissions Brad Lynch uh, to do another house in the, you know, in the lineage of Falling Water and, and his house in the Palm Desert. Um, Brad Lynch's quality and clarity has earned his practice wide acclaim, consistent wide acclaim. He's received numerous design awards uh, from the likes of the Architectural League, uh, from the Chicago Athenaeum and 20 some and counting AIA design awards. Uh, definitely a, a, a kind of register of a level of sustained quality that I think is really rare. His work, their work, has also been featured in two monographs and uh, as well in, in numerous journal articles. Uh, and so, we're very fortunate to have a, a designer, an architect of, of such quality teaching with us in the studio and here this evening uh, to share his work. Uh, so please welcome me in welcoming Brad Lynch. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I'm not gonna give you that 10 bucks now. Um, can everybody hear me okay? So, hopefully this is something different. Um, so, the sacred and the profane. Uh, I sent this title to uh, who's ever handling the lectures, and apparently I had a typo, and this is, could have been what the lecture was, but um, could have easily been what the lecture was, both in content. Um, but actually, I was thinking about this little restaurant in Venice uh, where the two brothers, uh, the kitchen is up on the second floor, and the restaurant tables are on the first floor, and they yell at each other the whole evening uh, trying to get the food down from the upstairs down the steep stairs down to the dining room. Um, but uh, the only thing that we really know for sure about this Titian painting is that it was um, Nicola Oriolo most likely commissioned it because it's his coat of arms on the well there and on the fountain. And uh, it's also from the same year that he married Laura Bagarota. And everything else about this work is purely conjecture. And you may be wondering, um, well, personally, I believe that the sacred and the pain to be about time, about consideration of the moment, about permanence, and about temporal about love and pathos, and about experience and remembrance. And you're probably wondering why I'm showing you a painting, uh, but I'm really talking about architecture. And I want you to hear what is affecting our work, our conscience, and what influences us, and what is our reality. And I'm not gonna be uh, showing you a lot of patterning diagrams or technology that we work in today. I'm gonna talk to you about how I feel we're working in the profession today and where I, I think I feel the profession is going, and also where I think that you should be thinking about when you, if you go out into the profession. So our reality, our being our firm, is that we like to build things, and architecture is contingent on building. With little or no funds, a painter, a poet, a musician, or a writer can ply their craft. Buildings need sites, and they need uh, government approval, they need engineers, and construction crews, and most importantly, they need clients with funds and liquid funds, funds that actually pass the bank. So, excuse me. <clears throat> I would argue that the last seven years have been the most tumultuous for architecture, the most uncertain, and the most difficult to define or describe in my lifetime. As a profession, we are still working our way out of a recession, which was really a depression, and as an art form, there appears to be a lack of clarity of how architecture is beneficial and a dulling of enthusiasm for architecture in the public realm. The world is a different place, and the world of architecture has changed as well. The building boom in other countries has brought economic opportunity for architects when this country was faltering, but also a vast litany of soulless structures that foreshadow a precarious future and a questionable framework for societal development. Nevertheless, I remain optimistic. The students in this room are more fortunate than their predecessors of the last eight years because there will be work for you when you graduate. 
how businesses perform work is rapidly changing, and with that, new work environments are needed. Viable urban centers are growing and becoming more centralized, and density is the way of the future. Immigration will continue to grow, and so will our need for housing. Private and public institutions and universities are expanding at a rate not seen since World War II. And very soon, Congress will have to bite the bullet. Uh, it's difficult for me to even talk about them right now, but uh, they will have to bite the bullet to undertake a massive spending program for construction as our nation's infrastructure is coming, crumbling around us. The question is, will our next building boom only represent economic, economic prosperity with increased billing and profits for architects, or will we be thinking about what we build, for whom, and what are the consequences of what, consequences of what we leave behind? So I wanted to start out with this picture of my grandmother, Cora. And Cora died in 1994 at the age of 103. Cora witnessed some of the most ad major advances in science, modern invention, and technology in her lifetime, as well as significant changes in political economics around the world, and just some really important stuff. So this includes uh, two World Series wins of the Cubs, Automobile production, flights, the Martini, seven American wars, including two world wars, women's right to vote, communism, fascism, penicillin, polio vaccine, the GI Bill, Israel, free cigarettes on airplanes, hijacking of airplanes, civil rights, space travel, Sanford and Son, the Macintosh, and the end of apartheid. Pretty much everything happened in her lifetime that we know today. Um, and the architecture of Cora's lifetime was pretty magnificent as well. And I hope I don't have to name any of these buildings, um, but they're different, they're of the time, they're of amazing development in terms of technology and in terms of uh, aesthetic change reflecting uh, the society and the growth of uh, the new world at that time. And a lot of amazing stuff. A lot of it in Chicago. So another thing that grew exponentially in Cora's lifetime were, was business education. At her birth, there were only four collegiate business schools in the world. The first school, the ESCP, was established in Paris in 1819. And the first in the United States was in Philadelphia. And now there are over 13,000 business schools worldwide. The second business school in the United States was established at the University of Chicago in 1898, where admission to what was then called the College of Commerce and Politics required history, Latin proficiency, fluency in a modern foreign language, studies in English literature, advanced mathematics, physics, and philosophy. Most of the business schools at top universities had similar requirements up until World War II. Few industries have enjoyed more impressive record of growth in graduate management education has experienced since 1960. The output of business master's degrees grew for 20 years after 1960 at an average annual rate of 12%. Just in the United States, total output of MBAs in 1981 was 55,000, more than the output of law and medical schools combined. It is now well over 150,000 and represents 32% of all graduate degrees conferred in the United States. Worldwide, there are now over 1 million MBAs graduated every year and still growing. They have proceeded to take over architecture just like they have taken over every other profession and business that's out there. And it will not be long before they'll be controlling how a building is designed, much like they control how a medical procedure is decided. And you should know your enemy. Uh, by the way, I just wanted to show this because this is a uh, uh, Strand Books, from Strand Books' website in New York, New York City. Um, you can actually order books by the foot online. So they will organize it for you, take a photo of it, and um, then you can pick and choose what photo, you know, books you like in their arrangement in the case, and then they'll send those and create them up for you in case you just need to have those books. So um, this is Gordon Moore. Um, I presume some of you know maybe who this is, he's the co-founder of Intel. And he wrote an article in 1965 for Electronics Magazine entitled, Cramming More Components Onto Integrated Circuits, 
A few years later, it became widely known as Moore's Law. Perhaps more of a business plan than a naturally occurring law, it describes a long-term trend in computer technology in which the number of transistors that can be placed inexpensively on an integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years and will continue to do so until after two, uh, 2015. And he has, proven, has been proven or proven himself to be absolutely right. At the beginning of the 21st century, socioeconomic change and development has leveled or reversed while technology continues to grow exponentially. Everything is and will be for some time about the fastest, easiest, and most comprehensive delivery of information and technology, and as also what the world of MBAs is focused on, but from a purely economic model. No matter what theory or law of technological growth one buys into, one thing is indisputable. Technology is growing at a rate much greater than knowledgeable content can be created, developed, produced, and incorporated into that technology. In architecture, the most advanced technological systems used in the design of buildings is now often outdated or superseded by the time the building is actually completed. And in life, well, when was the last time you had a conversation? So this is my son, Blake, who was born the year after my grandmother died in uh, so 1995. He's wearing um, that Che Guevara t-shirt, not because he's a steadfast Marxist, but because um, he thinks that's his cousin, because actually uh, Che's last name is Lynch. Um, I don't know if you knew that, but it's Ernesto Guevara Lynch. He's, he's actually half Irish. So um, not a Marxist, though. But this is what's happened in his lifetime. Simon Cowell, the iPhone, and Viagra. Um, compared to what happened in my grandmother's lifetime, even though the technology range has been shortened, not a lot, but I'll give you the human genome was probably a probably good you know, development. But there's still been some good architecture happening in terms of his lifetime as well. And again, I'm hoping I don't have to name out of these buildings. But a good run, I'd say, in the last 18 years. But, you know, good architects also do bad architecture. And um, this is the Portland building. And... Um, I don't know why this building is still standing other than that it was a monument to really bad architecture. And then even really great architects can really do really, really bad architecture. And then, you know, everything has to be branded these days. So if you're going to live in something, everybody wants a BMW, a Maserati, an Audi A6, you know, so people start thinking of themselves in terms of living and branded living. Um, and why not give a brand to what houses are, as we're doing in many cases? I tend to think about architecture in terms of what is good and what makes good on the land and what makes good in the world. And I find that most of the architecture that I really love, most people won't call architecture at all. It's a vernacular influence, and it seems to fit into its place in the world, both in terms of regionalism and in terms of its environment, um, and in terms of its impact, and in terms of its character better than, um, I would say, 90% of what most architects produce. A little trip around the world here. And I think that when we look at land, um, and one of the great things is looking at land, these are photographs by Terry Evans, is everything you can see makes a mark on the landscape. And these could just as easily be a urban plan for um, an aerial photo of New York. It could be an aerial photo of um, Venice or Florence. Um, and what you read in terms of looking at this in terms of the site and the impact that it makes in terms of where you're going I think is kind of a precious move. And so you always want to be looking at what is it that affects the land and what's on there. So we look at things like this, which is a corn crib just down in the middle of the field in Indiana, and we look at the materiality, and then we say, that looks pretty cool, and how can we integrate that into something that we're doing in terms of the same type of flat land and structure and get the same kind of materiality and so forth out of it. And going back in history, I know you're probably wondering, 
what is a diehard modernist showing a late Baroque project for. But I love this project. This is the, um, the uh, Sedone Chapel, the Shroud of Turin. And unfortunately, it burned, uh, and they haven't finished repairing it yet in the, uh, a number of years ago. But Guerin of Guarini, the architect, was actually trained as a mathematician. And even though it's late Baroque, um, this is, his faces are about proportion. Um, they're about light. They're about balance. If you stripped all the ornament away out of these projects, they would be considered something by Khan, if you will. It's, it's, um, they're quite exquisite in terms of the way they just make you feel. And when we look at architecture, we want to make sure that something that we do that is out of permanent material has an effect that's going to last. We don't want to do something that's temporal. We want to do something that's permanent. Sometimes we do things that are temporal because we really want them to be temporary. Um, and we know that they're going to be temporary. But if we're going to do something out of materials that are of this nature, we want to make sure they're going to be able to last. And this is um, another Palazzo by Guarini. And then on the other side of the coin, coin is um, Alvarelto, his experimental house uh, in the lake region, central Finland. And this experimental house, I think, is, is actually a very important piece of architecture because it, it deals with a lot of things in terms of framing nature. It deals with experimentation and materiality. It's him breaking out of the international style modernist mode that most Finnish architects were in at the time and creating his own individuality that lasts and it lasts over a period of time. This, and in, in fact, this was, he didn't think this house was going uh, to be more of a temporary structure and study model than it was going to be a permanent vacation home, which was, it was a vacation home for him. And then, of course, his town hall, not far from this vacation home, where he's really playing with forms uh, that are based in the modern movement of the previous 20 years, but they really become his own. They really are different. And they're really in terms of about expressing himself in a way that he can leave his mark and independence on it. So in our work, we've been in business now almost 25 years. And we try and aim for at least consistency. The projects that are quickly showing you here are as old as 25 years. Some of them are $15 a square foot. Some of them are $750 a square foot. We really don't want people to think differently about the things that we've done for $15 a square foot than we do about the $750 a square foot spaces. And there's been a mixture of them. We do high-rise buildings. We do offices. We do um, custom residences. And we do institutional work. Um, and what I would like to do is tell you the story about three of them. And I want to tell you the story in terms of the relationship that we have with a client and how we got them and what they meant for us at that particular time. So this is the Racine Art Museum. This is in Racine, Wisconsin. And this is actually, at the time, called the Wisdom Museum. And uh, it was on 10 acres of land. It was donated by a farmer's wife to the city of Racine, along with about $100,000 in order to make it an art museum, only there wasn't any art. And they didn't have any art. They just, she just thought it would be a good idea. Unbeknownst to a young director who took it over years later, it, over the years that it developed a WPA collection of photographs and watercolors and paintings, mainly regional. And then this new director, who was actually only in his 20s, who came there in the, in the 1970s, um, started collecting craft, craft as art. Now, what was curious about this is that um, the there was a woman in town who was the daughter of H.F. Johnson. And H.F. Johnson commissioned the Johnson's Wax Administration Building and also Wing Spread by Frank Lloyd Wright. She was a very quiet woman in that town. No one really knew who she was. Her brother had a lot more attention in terms of what, in terms of notoriety. And, uh, and she was very quiet, but she was a huge art collector. She had all the major masters of the modern era. But one significant difference was that she was collecting craft with her painting and sculpture of basically you know, uh, blue chip art. And by doing so, 
it seems very simple now in terms of lining up objects with paintings, but by doing so, it was really changing the way that people looked at art and looked at craft as art. And so they got together at some point. They realized uh, that they had this common interest um, in terms of collecting. Back in the 60s, she had done a book called Objects USA Now, which really elevated the, the, the craft movement up to an art form in this country. And um, so they got together, and what happened is the conversation was going, and then by the end of the 1990s, she gave 400 of her best pieces, as well as, uh, I think, a endowment of a million dollars to the Wisdom uh, to have this. Well, their problem was, unlike a lot of other museums, is that they had no place to put this. They had no place to put the art, they had no or craft, and they had no place to store it. So they actually had to rent warehouse space um, in order to store the art. And the um, what developed was that because people heard where she was giving her art to, um, all of a sudden, within two years, he had 4,000 pieces donated from around the world. And again, no place to put it. So hence, I, that's where I come in. Um, and, the, and I knew, um, I grew up in Racine, so I knew um, the families connected to this. And, um, and I had done an art gallery for this woman, both in New York and in uh, Chicago. So uh, they talked to me about doing this museum. And so I was up there, and I was pretty giddy. I hadn't even turned 40 yet. And this was in the middle of um, the art museum building boom um, of the 90s. And so we thought we were going to do this $100 million, you know, incredible building um, on the Wisdom campus, because uh, there was 10 acres that we could build on. We would have it mixed with the old building. We were very excited. Um, this was going to be our big opportunity um, as, a, as a young firm. So, and we prepared all these materials in terms of what would go to them and how it would be, uh, could be realized. And uh, we had done you know, initial site planning and, and massing. Uh, and we knew we had to get a pledge. And uh, we knew who we were going to get it from. And we went to uh, her brother, and he says, yeah, this is wonderful. This is a great idea. He said, uh, I'm doing the sustainable thing downtown, and you can have this piece of shit building, and you have $5 million to turn it into an art museum. And what uh, nobody knew at the time was that actually this building was, or they didn't remember because they weren't old enough, uh, this building, was, which was wrapped in uh, limestone uh, in this very brutalist style in the 60s, was actually these three buildings underneath. And, um, and, and it had a history of them being torn down and remodeled. So there was actually seven different structures underneath this facade that went back to the Civil War era. And um, so that's a napkin sketch I did at the bar that I've indicated on the site diagram there, because that's what happens when you go to a bar when you find out that you're going to do a $100 million museum that it's now a $5 million museum. And uh, so these are kind of the initial sketches that I actually was doing because I think that we had explored enough of the museum in terms of uh, what we could do on the inside in terms of looking at the structure and how we could manipulate it using the galleries in, in a particular order so that we didn't have to make all the galleries perfect, but they would have a lineal approach in terms of how you would approach the galleries. And then the big question is what we were going to do to the outside, because we we're going to damage the limestone on the outside. We're going to change it. So the idea was to open up the center of the building, have it look towards the lake, and then clad the building in something. But we couldn't really afford to clad it in anything. So I called the director up um, and uh, said, Bruce, I have one word to say to you. And he goes, what's that, Brad? And I said, plastics. Um, and I realized that you're all too young here, so go rent the graduate tonight. Um, and what we did is basically change the diagram of what the floor layouts were in order to make it work. So we have the original on the left and what we had on the right. So the two parts that you see floating up in the air are the removal of the previous additions. We wanted the entry to reflect the main street so that it, it worked with the main street as opposed to the side. And we opened up the, the plan and basically we handled a lot of the floor differences and ceiling differences in the way that we had to handle mechanical equipment by layering gyp wall systems. And 
And here you can see in the section, you walk into this thing, you're actually facing the lake. Uh, there's a special storage room on the right there. And then the main gallery, uh, the temporary exhibition space is actually on the second floor. And then the controlled exhibit area is on the first floor. And this gives you an idea of kind of what we were working with what we had to shore up in order to make this work. Our testing of the uh, lighting on the plastic is actually acrylic. And opening up the center of the building. And then the front entry. That front entry is uh, perforated uh, steel uh, and then it's backlighted. And then there's a separate entry for the store, the museum store, that, so that it could actually have a retail presence on its own. We used uh, recycled rubber tires for the substrate of this flooring and then poured a vinyl flooring over it. Um, all the materials that we used in here were, were all recycled veneers, um, and very simple economic materials because obviously we didn't have much to work with. We did all the millwork design, all the initial exhibit designs. We came up with a, a TV monitor system for announcing exhibits because we didn't want the museum to ruin the uh, walls with the big graphics and we didn't know what kind of budgets they were going to have for it afterward. That's the second floor. That's the main uh, gallery with the lay light system above there. offices and library and the view from the lake. That is now one of the top 10 cultural tourist gender, uh, destinations in Wisconsin now. And we just finished that. They just celebrated their 10th anniversary. This next project is about me, really about me, because uh, this is my house. And so I'm the client. And this kind of tells a story about what happened when we decided to do a house and um, what happened in, in terms of going into when the house was finally finished and going into the recession. So uh, we started our firm back in 1989, 1989 and, and uh, had offices in River North. I got married in 1999, 1989, sorry, and um, we moved to uh, the near north side and bought a little bungalow there. And so what you see here is kind of a chart of what happened in my life, happened to the office, uh, and then happened with the house over the period from 1989 to 1997, or 2007, rather. And um, the blue line on the top is my stress level. Uh, and then the green is uh, my alcohol intake as my stress level goes up. So... The early years um, were about kind of getting our stars established, getting houses, getting them what we needed to do to get business and getting things built. We actually built a lot of our first projects ourselves. Um, we were owned contractors and in some cases our own developers on them just to get things moving. And uh, by 1999 we had celebrated our 10th anniversary uh, and you know things started getting more stressful. Um, I'm never home, so I really didn't care the house was falling down around itself. But uh, we'd had two kids by this time, and uh, it was pretty small. It was 900 square feet total, including the attic. Um, and we were talking about where we're going to live in the future and actually remodeling the house. This is what I had on my mind. I was going to build a vacation house up in Canada um, and didn't really want to spend any money on a city house. In fact, I wanted to move into an apartment in the city. And uh, I told you I was married, though, right? So um, that didn't happen. And uh, so then we started thinking about, well, what could we build in terms of just renovating this house so we wouldn't have to worry about really turning in this into a big project? So I had the idea that we would tastefully redesign um, the house so it kind of looked like it did originally, but we would gain more square footage and we would kind of do like a site thing of like leaving all the exterior walls traditional and just have like intervention space inside the interior. And I thought it was a really great idea, simple, and it cost a million dollars when I bid it out, so we weren't going to do that. 
that if we're going to spend anywhere near that kind of money, I said, well, we might as well build a new house. And um, so that's what got this whole thing going. And, but I was also very busy at the time. Um, it didn't take long for me to build this, but it was really putting a lot of stress. And there's the old house. We moved into another apartment. And there we go. And these are the renderings that we did. And this kind of explains what the space is. There's a basement that sticks up four feet out of the ground, the first floor plan, and the top floor. And this is pretty indicative of a lot of things that we do relative to residences, that we really talk about living space as a different space than bedrooms. So, the, the, you know, like the bedroom area of the house is typically the, very, the most private, um, not glamorous, uh, not big. Um, the work area in the house and the guest room are semi-private, and then we like to have, you know, the, the main living space as open and open to the outside and open to the public as possible. So our living dining space is completely open, um, 63 feet from two sheets of glass, one, so one on each side. And this gives you a good idea of, of how it's organized. It's basically two millwork volumes. And the stairs are the circulator around the volumes. And you move in and out of the volumes to get in and out of the space. And they're about three and a half feet wide. And then everything that's utilitarian is then fit into those millwork volumes. So the kitchen cabinets, the kitchen appliances, the closets, the mechanical system, everything kind of works out of that main area. Uh, of millwork. And then in terms of lining up the window functionality, uh, in terms of what are operable windows and not, we actually lined up the window so that using the open stair with the cool air in the summer, we don't need the air conditioning on a lot if we have the windows open because it actually acts like a big turbine in there to move the air from the bottom, which is about 12 degrees colder, colder because it's set down with in all this concrete, and then move it up through the house and out the windows. And then in the wintertime, we use a radiant system on the basement floor, and then we move the air up just by using the fan. And typically, we don't have to use the HVAC forced air until uh, we get into the very cold 18 below. I mean, 18 degrees or below. And this is under construction. It's a steel frame tube construction in terms of uh, the basic frame, and then the wood studs and trusses that you see are infill. And 2007. Still getting higher because now it's going in, and I, I just—I actually want to break now and give you a little technical advice. Uh, I said I wasn't going to give you technical advice, but I'll give you some technical advice. I'm going to tell you how to make a perfect martini. And first of all, you should know that there is no such thing as a vodka martini. It's called a kangaroo. There's only gin martinis. But just in case you want a vodka martini, uh, what you do is you take the glass and you swirl dry vermouth in the glass. You tip it upside down, and then let the, the twirl the glass as the vermouth drips out of the glass. Then you put the glass in the freezer, okay? So that the vermouth, that little skim of vermouth, freezes to the glass. Then what you do is you either freeze your gin or your vodka, uh, or put it in the freezer, and then you mix it with ice. And as you shake the ice, because you put the gin or vodka in the freezer, it becomes like a gel. And you have to put a lot of gin or vodka in the shaker because it's gelling up really fast, and you want to pour it in there. And the gel, slowly as it warms up in the glass as you drink in your hand, just releases enough vermouth to make it a perfect martini. And trust me, if, and your choice of Oliver Twist, it'll work wonderful. So that's my technical advice for you. Um, this is the delivery of our uh, big glass windows at the house. Uh, this was quite an ordeal. These weigh over a ton apiece. They're from Rochester Glass, um, who only is the only company that makes insulated panels this big, and they're in Rochester, New York. And they're shipped out by them. And we had to close down and get a special permit to close down the entire street and alley and bring in a crane in order to install these. The day that this was installed, I kid you not, the truck has 12 hours of drop-off time to deliver these. 100% uh, chance of thunderstorms. So two worst enemies in handling glass is wind and water. And uh, so the, and there was a hole <laughs> in the clouds above my house. 
as the truck arrived, and we did had just enough time to stage these and get them off the truck and actually get the first panel in. And there's a special 12 uh, suction cup attachment that goes to the crane, the, the gilla thing that you see there. And there's some guy in Wyoming that ha owns them all in the country, and you have to rent them from him for some reason. I don't know why. Um, and this is being when we're going, and I uh, was out just before this glass was delivered, I was out looking at it at Rochester Glass. And my cousin Danny called me up on the phone and said, have you been reading the New York Times? And I said, no, why, what, what, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And uh, he goes, well, have you been reading this whole mortgage implosion thing? And I said, no. And I said, well, I mean, I, I've heard about it, but I, that, does, that has nothing to do with me. That doesn't affect me at all. And um, th you know, that's for all these subprime mortgages, and that's not going to affect me. And then I got back from this trip, and I realized I hadn't heard from my banker in like a month and a half. And um, so I left a message, you know, being cute, saying, you know, um, geez, uh, have you guys gone bankrupt or something? Uh, you know, I haven't heard from you in a while. Well, in fact, they had gone bankrupt. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I had my entire uh, wealth into uh, cash payments going into this that was going to be uh, paid out to me uh, at the end by this mortgage that I had. And um, so then the stress really started. And uh, then it also started affecting work um, because that was the beginning of the end in 2000, the fall of 2007. The rush was in terms of getting all these development projects that we were working on. But um, through that time, at least I had this house. Um, so the object of the house was to be able to create this living room floor uh, where whether we had the shades up or down would control whether we had public exposure or not. And it was about basically going back to the idea of the front porch in city living so that you actually you experience something with your neighbors when you want to and you don't when you don't want to. So from the reverse side, when the shade is down, really nobody notices the house is there. But when it's open... It was a completely different experience. And we haven't done anything nasty there. But we've had a lot of parties, and it's pretty engaging to see you know, people arriving and coming and seeing this thing in operation. And this is going to take me a minute to fix, sorry. So <laughs> finished product, we're living in it, 2007 is going by, we're going into 2008. Um, the, again, you can see how this millwork works in terms of dividing the space, in terms of the finishes. Um, this is all reconstituted oak and uh, oak flooring and oak um, trim work. The kitchen, um, I never thought you should have more than eight people at a dinner party, so I forced the fact that you could only sit eight people at the, at the table. And this is the courtyard in the back, which is down below, which becomes very private away from the rest of the yards because we had sunk in it. And it gives you a very good idea in terms of how the work looks there. And then I also designed all the furniture, or I shouldn't say all the furniture, but the major furniture that went into the house. And so, Coming into 2008, it wasn't just that we were reduced in the amount of work that we were having. We were having developers go, that were working on larger projects, go bankrupt at us left and right or not paying their bills just entirely. And so by the end of 2009, um, we made a tragic mistake and got involved um, with going to another place to search out for opportunity. Uh, the biggest capitalist country in the world, run by communists. So um, we did this type of work day in and day out where we design uh, two million square foot buildings uh, in 10 different cities. We'd whip these things out in about six weeks, in total schematic design. And, uh, very, I think, uninspiring and uh, inappropriate. Um, 
but it kind of tells you the world that, of what we were dealing with over there. This is in Zhengzhou, and the design that we did for those two buildings, it's interesting because we put in all the building background and the city life there. This is actually uh, a mile away from any other building uh, in terms of its core development. And, you know, there's 100,000 of these going up. So by the end of 2011, we got really tired of that. That wasn't really for us. We could do the work. It was very strenuous. I was over there a lot, loved the food. Um, but we decided to go back and, and kind of concentrate on North America and kind of think that that is really where we belonged and not be worldwide, but have a manageable sized firm. So this is our office operation now. Uh, it's in a small building that we actually designed or rehabbed uh, 12 years ago on three floors. And the work that we tend to do now is, is for clients, um, uh, getting back to this idea of business uh, and how it affects architecture is that um, we tend not to do offices and we tend not to do commercial developments and we tend not to do anything that we can't deal directly with the owner on. So if we walk into a room and we're talking about a project with somebody and there's nothing but real estate attorneys and facilities people there, we're more than likely to walk out of that meeting because we don't want to be there. Because if the owner doesn't have interest in their project, we certainly shouldn't have interest in their project because then it's just about being a commodity. And so we've been very fortunate in terms of being busy the last few years in terms of getting projects like this. Uh, this is a rehab of a project in 860 Lakeshore Drive, the Mace, Mace Building. Um, the market is back in terms of Chicago, so we're doing a lot of apartment buildings and condos. This is a building that we're doing up in Toronto. Uh, our initial scheme that's actually grown from this. Um, and we get to do some really nice projects, and, and the next few projects are actually for the same client. And this is um, a project that we're doing uh, up in Wisconsin. It's a, it's a large acreage that we're master planning and working with Shane Cohen, the landscape architect, which is actually the first time I've ever worked with a landscape architect. Um, and we master plan this whole property as a vacation retreat for this owner. And that's still in the process. And we're new doing another building on it. I also did the offices for this guy's company, which is in a loft building, actually in our neighborhood, the West Loop neighborhood. And then we just finished this project um, last month, August. Um, and this is when these photographs are from. So it, this is in a very urban, dense neighborhood in Chicago with a lot of mixture in terms of building types. Um, and what you're seeing is copper, um, two types of brick, Roman brick and Norman brick and then a core 10 steel in front. So um, it's glazed. You see that OK? So the object of this was creating an experience within the city that would give you the urban experience in terms of the shell and basically create kind of a citadel in terms of privacy, in terms of the house. It's an L-shaped house. Um, what you're seeing here is bent corten steel and folded and opened up and, and closed in a way so that as you walk down the sidewalk or as you drive by, what you see in privacy and openness changes as you walk by or as you drive by. Um, and then this goes to the entry of the house. And this opens up then to uh, a courtyard view. Get rid of that arrow. Um, and then also working with Shane Cohen on landscape with this project, um, he's the idea, he came up with the idea of mounding in order to create a topography within the city lot and looking at the courtyard. But this is all about experience. It's about you know, how you can have urban living but still have this experience of light and openness. Um, and this is organized in boxes down to one side. So what you're seeing there is actually the wood as she's walking down one side, as the camera's moving down the other side of the hallway. The 
These are all people that work in my office. In case you were wondering why one guy was coming home. So, um, and this is walking down the other uh, hallway. So you get an idea there of kind of how the wood boxes are assembled. And the way that we organized materials was basically to reinforce this idea of indoor outdoor space. So the granite, you know, on the floor of the house, the granite on the terrace of the courtyard, the copper that runs through from inside to outside and, and equalized panels. Um, no matter where you are in the house, you can see the brick relationship in terms of looking outside. And then what we're looking at here is through back the living room and out to the core tent fence in the front. Same problem here for a second, I'm sorry. So this is the front entry, and uh, the wood that you see is a reconstituted walnut, uh, or walnut finish. Um, the floors are end grain walnut, the old industrial block type walnut. Um, this house, in terms of using the lots, we hit water three feet down, so the whole lot is actually sheet piled 30 feet around, so it's like a big bathtub. And we had to use a structural mat in order to reduce the, uh, the um, hydrostatic pressure that was rising up out of the land. So here you can see kind of the plan, kind of the box arrangement that works there. That follows through up into the second floor, which is the more private space. And there's two studios on the top floor, workspaces, each having their own uh, roof deck and, and green roof area. And then the garage um, has its own prairie grass green deck, and then it has platform planting for vegetables up there to get all the vegetables and flowers off the ground so that the rodents don't get them. Uh, and this is, kind of tells you about the massing, so the kind of the pinkish color on the left is the millwork volumes that define the division of the rooms. Um, on the right, it tells you what is the living space versus the private space. And also, um, this gives you an idea in terms of the systems that are used. We used a geothermal well system, and we used a high-velocity chilling system. All the blinds and the glass in the house are, are automatically controlled from an iPhone, as is the thermostat and the security. And the green roof system that you see here is all uh, water management. So we did a lot of patterning studies on the copper. I said I won't get into that. But this is uh, what the end result is in terms of deformation and embossing and then openings. And looking at what we were looking at was how can you see out of this in private areas like the master bedroom, but still have the privacy from the other side, and then having light come into those areas at the right and appropriate time. And then we decided to take um, that same patterning uh, and use it on the wood ceilings in areas like the dining room and in the kitchen ceiling here. And actually what it is is a, is a tool that uh, the mill worker developed so that we could punch square holes and then he punch it from the other side so they would grow the hole. And then there's um, spun sound insulation above it so that uh, in all this area of hard surfaces, when sound reflects off of one hard surface, it, it actually is absorbed into the ceiling. And then this gives you an idea in terms of how the whole house is wrapped with that core tent fencing. And public versus private again. And the courtyard with a view inside. So I guess my message is um, that in terms of the work that we do and the work that I encourage other people to do is that we're going to be coming into a world where people want to take the way that the work that we do. I'm not fooling myself in thinking that all work has been in the past that it's been good architecture. Even my grandmother's time, there was probably only 5% of the buildings were actually very well done in the time that she lived in. But um, more and more buildings are going to be about money formulas, economic formulas, about how we can get them produced really fast. Um, 
and not necessarily really good. So you have to be smarter. You have to know your enemy. You have to be smarter than them. You have to be better in the knowledge that they pretend to contain in terms of real estate, in terms of finance, in terms of what's going on in terms of the development world. And it has to be valuable to them uh, in terms of what the ideas are. And, and it's not about value as in valuable only. It's about values. It's about ethics. It's about being able to say no to someone and being able to say yes at the appropriate time. It's much better to say yes to architecture for humanity that needs a helping hand than it is to say yes to a developer that wants to build anything and uh, will leave not a very good lasting mark. So I just want you to know that I am thinking about what our footprint is on the world or other places, and I would hope that you would be doing the same. And thank you. Any questions? Yes. Well, I, I agree there's a lot, well, Toronto is like China right now um, in terms of the building boom. And um, there are a lot of um, uh, glass skyscrapers going on in Toronto and a lot of them look the same. Um, I think that, I think the difference, if, to answer your question firstly in terms of the difference between China and, and the other work that we're doing, I don't think the work in China had much soul to it. I don't think that um, it was about reacting as opposed to responding and that it was an economic model that had to be met and it had to be met quickly. And it wasn't about what these buildings were gonna be like for the people that used them. It was gonna be about what the buildings were gonna be like for the people that developed them. And the project that we're doing up in Toronto, which is actually evolving a lot from that rendering, is quite different in terms of its relationship, in terms of its site. It's, those are uh, somewhat historic silos. We have to leave those in place and so we want not to just have them there as a silo object, but we want to use them in a way that actually incorporates kind of a vernacular base to the building that works with the silos and then gives it a kind of a new and different life there. Randall? Well, I think the process for educating a, a, a residential client is much different, you know, a custom residential client is much different for us than educating a commercial client or an office client. Um, a residential client pretty much knows they want to use this when they come to see us, so it's not like I have to do a big sales job. It's more about talking about what they want to achieve uh, by doing the house in the first place and then responding to what they want to incorporate into it. And programs generally for houses are almost all identical. You know, it's like, I don't care whether it's 3,000 feet, 5,900 feet, or 17,000 feet. Everybody kind of, you know, goes off their list of things that they want. And they're very similar. I think the thing that's really difficult in terms of doing with a custom residential client is trying to get them to tell you what they really want out of a house, uh, which is different than how many rooms that you have or the type of kitchen appliances that you have. It's about, you know, what do you want to experience? You know, what do you want to do when you wake up in the morning? How do you want to feel? Um, and those are different than like, you know, how much power do you want? And what kind of H AV systems do you want? Working with a commercial client is entirely different because there it is about trying to differentiate yourself from a huge market and quite frankly, a cutthroat market. Um, the, and the architecture of putting employees into a building or putting students in the classroom uh, over the years has become a economic model more than it has become a model for learning or how you work in the office. Spending money on real estate is the biggest waste of money anybody in business can think of. 
spending money on buildings. They don't like to spend money on buildings, but they have to do it because they have to put people somewhere. And as soon as you start thinking of real estate in terms of square footage, how many people can you fit in X number of square feet, and what is the bottom line cost for that, then you're not going to, in the long run, have a very successful business. And what in today's business world, which is changing so dramatically in terms of how people work, where they work, how they accomplish their work, it's about talking to the client about what they want to achieve by even having employees. So, and how do they want to work together, as opposed to a commodity of space. And, um, and generally what we talk about is what is, do you want to achieve with your business? What do you want to have employees for? Why are they there? How do they communicate with each other? How are they going to relate? How do the spaces work for them? How are they going to have free time with each other? And because in the long run, if you're going to spend anything on real estate, it has to have value to you. And not, again, I'm not saying value in terms of value of money, but value in terms of running your business. There has to be something that it's doing for you. And if it's not doing for that for you, it's not really working integrally with your, your business. And as I said before, <coughs> um, it tends to be the owner that understands that. It doesn't, it almost is never the people that work for the owner that understand that. And um, you know, one of the perfect examples I can give you is Skid Moines and Merrill in terms of their work in Chicago. And, um, and what Bruce Graham used to work on, who was the senior design partner there back in the late 50s and actually through the 70s, retired in the 80s, I guess. Um, Bruce Graham designed, um, or at least he thinks he did, the Sears Tower, the John Hancock Building, Kimberly Clark, and the Inland Steel. Inland Steel happens to be one of my favorite buildings in Chicago. Um, the common denominator between all those buildings is that he had a relationship with the chairman of the company of all those companies. He would go to Europe with them, he would buy art with them, they would go out to dinner, they would have conversations about literature, they would talk about the architecture together, and they would have this relationship. Uh, he would show slides later on in his life that showed, you know, these are buildings that I did later in my career. I can't even remember the names of the buildings because they were so bland and so corporate. And he used to say that, you know, he'd walk in the room and there'd be four real estate attorneys and six facilities managers and executive vice president in charge of uh, the building project. And um, what was absent was the owner. What was the absent uh, was the leader. And if somebody's not leading the project, it's not going to happen. And you have to, I mean, that makes the client a very important individual. And it makes them the one who wants good work, a very enlightened individual. Larry? I think that I think that in terms of our work, um, the uh, um, since we actually build our original projects, and we were looking for an idea, and I've told this to some of uh, my students this year, is that, and, and and part of the reason that we're doing the project that we're doing in the studio this year, is because I want them to think like a client, as much as anything else, and um, I constantly think about space. I constantly think about experience, and I always am sketching that. Now, when was, I was younger, these were really simple, basic ideas. They were like, how could I do a room this particular way using something that would divide that space, and still I could hide the lighting and make um, natural lighting come through into the space. And so it started out very small. And then um, as we grew in age, and as we grew in experience, and as we grew in realizing how these things could be done, then it, become very, then it became very fast. And then it became, it's like, you know, doing axial plans and linear plans. But like, what am I going to do today that can expand upon that idea so that the whole project is that way as opposed to one room? And the more that you do it, it becomes more of, I, you know, 
secondhand. It's like, you know, you don't know you're doing it. It's like, it's like you just realize you're doing it as it happens. And then, you know, you're hoping that you have the opportunity when you're thinking in that mindset that you, that something comes along that you can use that on. And um, that's always the hard part, you know, because oftentimes you lose ideas that are really strong because you don't have a way to build it or you don't have a way to realize it. And we don't have the time to do theoretical work um, because we like to keep our firm small, we like to keep it busy, and um, we like, you know, actually experimenting in terms of what we're going to do on the projects that we're building. Yes? You speaking like the China work, you mean, in, in terms of not knowing that culture? In general, um, and then in the work you showed, though, you seem to, to, to emphasize this, um, uh, this importance of how um, Absolutely, I, I think I think the I I think it is in general yes, and I think for us it's possible yes. I, I would the, the first thing I would refer to is public architecture and federal architecture, and like the GSA Design Excellence Program, um, in terms of because we're in the public trust, and in, in order to get that work done, and hopefully bettering the type of buildings that we get in in our society and in our, our built environment, and we're trusting the government to build it for us. Now, obviously, for many, many years, that went astray, but I think the Design Excellence Program is doing an excellent job of building buildings of our time. And historically, I think some of the great buildings of our time and place have been federal buildings, and that's how people think of architecture. People don't think of houses. You know, I mean, frankly, right, Falling Water is probably one of the most, is the fa most famous house in the world, I would imagine. But when they, people think of architecture, I don't think they think of houses. They think they think of uh, cathedrals and libraries and, and buildings and, and, and public buildings. And, and that frames their conversation and, and their attitude about architecture. And architects are a really important part of that. And um, I'll give you a perfect example of what it, I think architects can do for society. And people re don't realize the process of how architects can affect society. So the Supreme Court building, um, Gilbert, I think, right? So uh, um, uh, what is the most famous phrase in modern legal terminology? Does anybody know or guess? Um, I'm forgetting what it is myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's why I was asking you. Um, uh, give me one second. So, um, 
OK, I remember now. It's called it's equal justice under law. Uh, equal justice under law. And equal justice under law is emblazoned on top of the doors of the Supreme Court building. You know who wrote that phrase? Does anybody? Where that came from? Any idea? Want to guess? Exactly. <laughs> Cass Gilbert was looking for something that would fit in on the entablature, that fit the width of the doorway. And, and that's what he came up with. And that is now the, uh, probably the most famous lexicon used in, in our legal world today. Uh, and it's referred to by one of our justices there when um, our chief justice, I can't remember his name, wants to close the doors in terms of allowing people to come in openly into the court. And um, the other justice is arguing against it because he says this is the way that people come through. And this is the way the architect designed it. And it was for the people to come through and represent that they do have equal justice under the law. And an architect did that. And I think that's a powerful argument about how public architecture and architects can change the way that we think about our world. And it's just not about money. Um, and it's not just about notoriety. It's about what your effect on the world is going to be. Because once you build it, it's hard to take it down. And thanks again.